Hi, my name is Mark Birnat. I'm a monetary economist. In this video, I want to talk about game theory, game theory and psychology connected to this ICBM, this exchange, this hypothetical dilemma that the world is in, in relation to the geopolitical conflict initiated by Moscow. So the game theory, as you know, everybody knows, a, uh, I, I, since I'm an economist, I know game theory very well. And in the words of Mr. Spock, first season, episode 17, The Gothis Esquire, no man can predict the actions of another. So again, I'm not making a claim that I can predict the future, but based on game theory, and I have a lot of experience in economics with game theory, as well as personal experience with game theory, I think we can make some or postulate some ideas of what might happen and why the probability of anything catastrophic happening is extremely low to none. That's a bold claim, and it counters a lot of the claims you see being pumped in the media, which is really a propaganda thing or originating from Moscow, and anybody can put a text of you know, some ma massive claim of something tragic. But that's not going back to psychology or game theory as we know in economics. And if you know economics, then you know the prisoner's dilemma. But there's other game theories like the hawk dub problem, battle of the sexes, the stag game, the ultimatum, the public good game. And, you know, there's various levels of Nash equilibrium, Parado equilibrium. And some of the applicable things you may say is that this, oh, this is a ultimatum game. It isn't an ultimatum game because the Tsar of Russia is the master of lies. And you can't take it seriously anymore. The boy who cried wolf too much. And then you can say, well, what kind of game is it? You know, battle of the sexes, as they call it, is... Uh, and I don't necessarily like that terminology, but it's it's an economic or game theory game in which people have different objectives, but they're willing to uh, play for different outcomes and create an optimal solution. It's more like the stag theory of games, perhaps, or the hawk dove is the obvious one. But I like the idea of the stag, which you have the possibilities of a of a dangerous outcome and a, and a safer risk outcome for self interest. Now, how does this all apply to what's going on in the world today in ICBMs? I'm going to talk to you about my personal experience with this, not with ICBMs, but in a game simulation. When I was a kid, I played infinite number of games, let's say hundreds of games uh, by this company called SPI Simulation Publication, Inc. Jim DeGuardian in 1976 published a game, and it was called WW3 in which it was conventional Soviet Union versus the world. And you also had the option to go, obviously, ICBM. But here's the, here's the kicker with this, is the game theory is not about the probability of what happens after the ICBM. It, it's, it's before. It's the psychology behind it. And we're going to get into that. So I played this game until I had, again, until I basically had rickets because I was inside. Other guys, even in high school, beginning of high school, or, or, you know, I was re playing game, board games and reading Lord of the Rings. They were dating, you know, okay, whatever. It's the idea that you don't want the game to end. And the way the game was set up is everything would go conventional. And if one person was losing, the, you, they had the option of using an ICBM. Now, once the ICBM was fired, you uh, roll based on a probability table of an exchange. Obviously, uh, an exchange means that the person who initiates it loses. It's not too far from the truth because the U.S. has clearly stated to the Tsar of Russia that we know where he is at all times. It would be catastrophic to him and the people that work around him. Okay, so that's a pretty big state. And that's not an idle threat. One thing I don't want to do is play against America because they, they play hardball. And they really do, if, if the proper leadership is in place. And we're going to get into that later, but or not. But here's the thing. Uh, so when we played these games, we never had an ICBM going. And I played it hundreds of times with different people. Because once you're in game and you've invested so much in that game, psychologically and mentally, you don't want to just end it. Once the game's over, the game's over, the party. So even if you're kind of like losing, I know it's an abstraction and it's, I know it's not totally relevant. It may not be as accurate as representation as like Sid Meier's Civilization games. And that's something different. And probably a better representation, but the, the fundamentals of this board game were the same, that nobody wants to take it to the next level because then the game ends and the party's over and it's no fun. 
how can you apply that to what's going on in the world today? It does apply because Putin does not believe in an afterlife or God. Okay. He just does not. His only chance for survival is his genes through his children and his genetic line. Right. And he's not going to jeopardize that or, and all the, all the oligarchs and their kids, they're all in the West. They're using U.S. dollars, euros, right? They're not using rubles and just hanging out there. They're all in the West having investment properties. They're not going to jeopardize that form of immortality, of genetic immortality. Am I not correct? So he's playing for very high stakes that he, in my opinion, he's willing to lose the game rather than, you know, sink an ICBM, a loaded, a loaded ICBM somewhere. You have to meditate on that point. It comes from the psychology of the player because that's what game theory is based on. Now, we're going over this. We have to go into the psychology deeper of, of the Tsar of Russia. I don't even say his name for obvious reasons. How do I make that claim? Because the president of Belarus has mentioned and said that he personally, him, is an orthodox atheist. Okay. That means he doesn't believe in that stuff. But he's promoting this orthodoxy and this idea just for political reasons, cultural reasons, world domination. That's, that's the objective of civilization or a lot of games, you know? So this idea is very useful for him in a Machiavellian political sense. Vlad Lexer is somebody who I respect. You know, he's part of this, I'll call it loving community. He is great. I just love the guy. He's, he was born in Moscow. And, you know, Anne Rice says we're all products of our own time and trapped in this mindset. He doesn't even understand his atheism is projecting onto religious people a cartoon-like understanding of mysticism. Mysticism means to close your lips. Okay? It means to close your lips. His Vlexer has never spent time probably in a monastery. This behind me is actually, it's, it's a cloister, a monastery. People there are just very humble, giving the shirt off their back, doing anything. You know, the Tsar of Russia is out there just making uh, bluffs about humanity in, in an existential sense. This is not the signature of a radical alteration of your life, because that's what religion means. Religion is getting back to the source, and radical means to the root. A radical alteration is somebody like Mother Teresa, somebody in a cloister. Spend some time in a monastery with the Trappist monks and see what mysticism really means. It means to close your lips. And the Tsar of Russia hasn't closed his lips, hasn't closed his mouth forever. It just keeps on going on. And again, if you know the uh, biographers about uh, the Tsar of Russia, the, the, the man behind the mask or the, the faceless man, I forget what it's called, he will jump up and down, kick, scream, cry, pull hair, poke your eyes. He'll do everything to make this noise and chatter when he's backed into a corner. That was his psychology when he was younger. So he will do those big bluffs, but his underlying premise is his only chance of an afterlife is his genetic line continuing. And that is something you have to meditate on. He is not a mystic. He is not religious. The H guy in Germany, if you read about it, he was claiming, you know, and everybody claimed he was religious and, you know, even mystical and all this, the 1940s. That is not true. You look at, uh, I think it was Otto Stras uh, Strassenberg, and he wrote, the H guy and I, and his secretary, she clearly stated, this guy is an atheist. He does not believe in it on higher good. It's not like the Tsar of Russia is, is in America, you know, reading the Bible and holding hands and fellowship and Bible study or, or going to these Benedictine monasteries. Anybody that makes that claim has a cartoon-like understanding of what religion is. It's an authentic walking the walk type of idea. It's you are your religion. So the Tsar of Russia is not. His only chance is his genetic line survival. The West has already hinted at things, and he is not going to jeopardize that. He'll go down in flames before he jeopardizes that. So his claims and his scare tactics that the media is just eating up, this propaganda 3.0, okay, is simply, again, bluffing. Because remember in the movie The Exorcist, The Exorcist says, the dangerous types of lies are those lies with mixing lies with truths. And that, that is what the Tsar of Russia does. We've got to understand game theory, psychology behind game theory. Who is the players? There's zero to no chance that he is going to continue with that bluff for the reasons I outlined. 
think about this prisoner's dilemma and the game theory which I presented. Think about the psychology. Now, are we saying that post-apocalyptic Dysparian future may not exist? It may in some scenario, science fiction scenario, particularly if you ever saw 12 Monkeys and, you know, the, the biological aspect, but not with ICBMs, okay? It just, it's just too, too much cream, not enough milk in terms of the way they bluff, and it doesn't fit into the model that they're doing. You know, when I talk about these biologicals, okay, and I'm a big fan of, like, genetics and even CRISPR and engineering to save and make the world a better place. So, you know, mad scientists, let's say, can figure out a way to circumvent that it affects some, some people and not the others. So that being that the Russians play a long game is a more plausible scenario, particularly if you put it in the context of game theory and my exposure of the Tsar of Russia as not a mystic, not a religious person, but rather just simply somebody who's trying to continue with his people and gene line and that type of immortality he's seeking. You know, and then if, if you ask me, I would side with the people behind me. A true transcendence, authentic life where we try to make the world a better place. Be a light in the world to others. Okay, give the shirt off our back if necessary. Make sacrifice because that's what this world is about. It's a school and we better learn these lessons. So the world can rest assured. They can be at peace. You do not have to feed the dark side because the dark side relies on this negativity and fear. And that's what he's trying to stroke. You can project good things for humanity and light and ignore that type of energy, that dark side energy. Go with the light side. My name is Mark Birnott. I'm a monetary economist. And have a great day. Thank you very much.